Welcome to Moby Monday. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Yvette Moyo, and I'm the co-founder of Moby, Marketing Opportunity in Business and Entertainment. And for those that are not familiar with our platform, the Moby Symposium series is almost 30 years old. And our intent is to accelerate business. We are black owned and um, Mar Moby is marketing opportunities in business and entertainment. And we've been an accelerator um, for energizing and elevating uh, black marketing success. And tonight we have a very serious subject. Sometimes we use the tagline um, only at Moby and for sure, uh, this particular topic is rarely covered in the marketing, advertising, and entertainment industry. But those industries are very intricately involved in the solution to something that we're going to talk about tonight, which is sex trafficking and human trafficking. It is the fastest growing industry in the world, second only to the drug industry. It is a global $150 billion industry. And make no mistake about it, it is a modern day slavery that is happening right here in the US in urban, suburban and rural areas. Entertainment and sports ministry and education industries are coming together to fight this threat. It's a threat to our men, women and especially our children. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And I will turn this over to our uh, our moderator tonight, Mr. Uh, uh, from Prairie View University, and we've had a, a, a relationship, Prairie View A&M University, we've had a relationship with the organization for some time, so I'm particularly uh, thrilled to introduce uh, this uh, gentleman to you. And then I'll be signing off um, to listen to this very, very important conversation about solutions which is what Moby is known, known for. So Dr. Larry Hill is moderating the panel tonight, Human Trafficking. And uh, he is an assistant professor of, of social work at Prairie View A&M University, who brings 20 years of experience and solution making into this role. He has worked on research teams that are focused on a wide range of innovative solutions that have impacted foster care systems, mental health outcomes, disaster response, and the lives of, of many uh, high school and college students. Uh, to, Mr., to Dr. Hill, uh, we salute you for your work. And at this moment, I'm going to welcome you to Moby and uh, thank you for moderating this very, very important subject matter. Well, thank you, Yvette, for having um, all of us. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. We have three amazing individuals who I think the audience is gonna appreciate. Uh, we're gonna learn from them. Uh, I'm here as your moderator, um, but I'm also here to learn. Hopefully there's some questions that I prepare that you might have. Um, there's gonna be some questions that I definitely have as a assistant professor in social work. Uh, I Always, I'm engaged in what's going on, but I can tell you uh, point blank, I don't know everything that's going on. And so to have three experts uh, like we do today, um, filling this panel, uh, it's gonna be a blessing, I think, to, to all of us. Uh, first, I wanna introduce Rich Love Society. We are, uh, we're excited to have you on board. Um, she is an amazing woman. Um, so many characteristics that we can learn from, uh, but what she brings to the table today is, uh, you know, we like to talk about, um, we, we talk about sex trafficking, we talk about human trafficking, we may even watch a movie about it, um, but it's, it's something else when um, you have someone who is a survivor and a leader who escapes the situation and then makes a decision to come back and help. Um, she is uh, the 2020 uh, Real Beauty, Real Women uh, Activist Award winner, uh, 2019 uh, Blogger of the Year. Uh, she has multiple national uh, publications. Uh, she has an amazing uh, music, music video. 
um, several actually. Uh, they came out. I watched uh, the testimony uh, just recently, and I was, I was brought to tears. Honestly, um, we are fortunate to have you on board. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you so much. God is good for sure. Absolutely. Uh, next on board, uh, we have uh, Jacqueline Aluato. Um, again, she's an amazing, amazing woman. Uh, she will not talk great about herself, but I look forward to talking great about her. Um, you will constantly find her as an expert in uh, human trafficking and sex trafficking, both here in Houston and nationally. Uh, she is a producer. She's an activist. She's an advocate. Um, you'll learn a little bit more about exactly what she is doing, uh, but she is both a visionary and a leader and an innovator in this space. And so we are very fortunate to have Ms. Jacqueline Aluato uh, with us today. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hill. Thank you. Thank you. And she is also co-founder uh, with the uh, No Trafficking Zone initiative. And you'll hear a little bit more about that um, in the session. The other co-founder is Dr. James Dixon III, or second, sorry. Um, an amazing individual. I've had the pleasure of working um, on different initiatives with, uh, with, with Bishop Dixon in the past. And he is always busy. He's always around and he's always helping people. Uh, but the thing that I think impresses me the most is not only is he a visionary, but he takes ownership and leadership of his congregation in this issue. Um, it's very easy. It's very easy for pastors, for leaders of different kinds in the religious sect to, um, to turn a blind eye. Uh, but for some reason, uh, Bishop Dixon has turned his head towards the issue. And so we welcome him here today. Thank you. Good to be here. Okay, so let's uh, let's get into the discussion. Um, first, we need to know we need to know about you. So give us a small introduction of who you are. Uh, let's start off with uh, Rich Love. Man, I mean, just listening to you, you introduce me, I feel like I I'm not even worthy of introducing myself. <laughs> um, I am just a regular girl. I mean, I'm a woman now, but at the time. I think um, people weren't really speaking about human trafficking. That wasn't something that I had ever heard of. And I can really say that what really changed my life was meeting Jacqueline Aludo, who's here today with us, um, really opening my eyes to where I've totally turned my pain into purpose. I had a really bad drug addiction, which kind of goes with the territory. A lot of times I was groomed by a woman and you know drugs keep people in line so that is something that i went through and once i came out of it i really never spoke about what happened to me i had a radio show called the testimony it was the only faith-based um, show on this hip-hop urban radio station but i was so ashamed and i think that the knowledge is definitely power people say it and they, they see it as something cliche but i think that platforms like this that allow you know, experts and survivors to speak about this is so important. Um, and with music, I've turned my pain into purpose. I have a blog, Rich Love Society. So I think God is amazing. And the merge of, you know, faith, ministry, entertainment is so powerful because there are so many other Rich Love Societies out there that need to hear this and activists like Jacqueline and Bishop. So I'm just excited to be here and so grateful to be on this platform with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next, Jacqueline. Um, okay. I would say that I am a, an activist. Really, actually, no, the core of me is I'm an advocate. I believe that all people need to be advocated for. And if they cannot use their voice, then people with power and platforms to do everything that they can to lend their voice to those people. So that, that is what I am. Well, thank you. Thank you. Bishop Dixon. Well, first of all, again, thank you for, for having me. I'm so grateful to be included uh, on this esteemed uh, uh, panel of, of, of individuals who bring expertise and wisdom to the subject of 
of combating the scourge of trafficking. Uh, and uh, I, I want to spend my moment just emphasizing who is on this panel in the personage of, of, of Rich Love and Jacqueline Maludo, uh, who both uh, were very understated in the terms of them describing themselves. Uh, Rich Love is a generational influencer and uh, an individual who is connecting her story to other people's reality. And I think that that is profoundly uh, powerful. Uh, when you're able to connect your story to other people's reality in order to help them discover uh, the greatness within themselves wh while they may not be living that greatness out uh, is what she's gifted to do and she's passionate about. And uh, and so we, we want to applaud her and recognize uh, that here's a person who has transformed her pain into power and her story into substance. Uh, some people whine about their stories and their past and other people win on their stories. And uh, and that's what uh, Rich Love is doing. And then Jacqueline Deludo, uh, I cannot believe how little she said about herself. She's just an activist. That's, that's, that is so, uh, that's, that's like saying Rolls Royce is just a car, right? Uh, but, but, you know, but, but Jacqueline Deludo is a foremost, uh, in, uh, system, she is a system of intelligentsia when it comes to human trafficking and social impact. And I say a system of intelligentsia because not only does she bring insight about the industry of trafficking itself and how trafficking happens, who it happens to, why it happens, when it happens, where it happens, uh, but she also brings uh, a solutions perspective from how to deal with restoring victims uh, and how to help people to recover uh, their dignity, their pride, and their sense of sacred essence. Uh, and so from a recovery perspective uh, individually, but then also a recovery perspective from institutions, how shelters should operate, what it takes for a shelter to be a great shelter or facility to be a great facility. Uh, and then another dimension of that, of course, is the law enforcement perspective, how to prevent victims from becoming criminals when they've been victims as opposed to criminals. Uh, uh, she has the law enforcement perspective on that uh, and how to treat a victim who's going through the process of law enforcement so that they do not live in their shame, but discover that while they're in the process, they too are worth recovery and restoration. So she has a wealth of, 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 of information. So I call her a system of intelligentsia on the subject of, of trafficking. Uh, but, and beyond that, she's an in-your-face uh, kind of person about that. Uh, to make you say, either you're going to do something about it or get out of the way. Uh, because mm -hmm. as, 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 you know, as, as kind as she and Rich may look and sweet right now, when it comes to saving lives and making an impact, they're like non-negotiable. And uh, so their fire will light your fire. If you got anything in you like a flame, uh, their fuel will, 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 will fan it. And uh, like Rich Love, I mean, our church, the community faith, have been dabbling with trafficking for years off and on doing some things and i've been doing some things personally but uh learning about it from the universe that jacqueline described it in to me for four years ago helped me to understand that i need to shift this into uh a major ministry stream for our church and mm -hmm. uh and then not only for mine but also to help other pastors to understand how this fits into our mission that's connected to the great commission that jesus christ gave us so uh uh kudos to them hats off to them because they're inspiring leaders to become leaders who impact the, the world of sex and human trafficking. So I'm glad to be a part. Well, it's great to have you. So that lends us to um, to launch off here. Um, welcome the audience. Welcome to all of you. I'm not sure why you're here, but it's great that you're here. It's great that you're at the table. Um, this is human trafficking, how entertainment, sports, and ministry collide to combat this threat. First, let's start off with a very simple, very simple question. Uh, we hear about human trafficking, sex trafficking, uh, slave trade. Uh, mm. Jacqueline, what is this term that we keep hearing, human trafficking? What is it? So I think that uh, we should call human trafficking what it is, which is the sex slave trade and exploitation of people. Um, Specifically what that means and, and how that really works. And I'll just get into it with 
children because that seems to be a big um, topic for people that they don't think it can ever be their children. Um, sexual exploitation happens a lot in different ways. You can be human trafficked over 30 different ways or sexually exploited. And one of those ways is um, right now with the pandemic, pandemic, which is coronavirus, um, the slave trade has also become a pandemic. Uh, when kids are at home from school, they're on their devices. So let's just say I'm a little boy and I'm playing Fortnite and I have to buy things online and a, a little girl befriends me and she says, hey, and we become friends and well, I can give you some money for what you need to buy on this video game. And then they become friends and she says, send me a picture of yourself. And then they send each other pictures of themselves. And then the little boy takes off his shirt and the little girl takes off their um, shirt. And this becomes a continuation um, until there's like naked pictures of your child online. Um, and then there's that child could meet a person which turns out to be an adult. Um, well, let's, let's, slow, let's slow down here. Sure. Let's slow down here. As a parent, that's not possible. Hmm. Not my kid. Right? Well, I would say go back to when you were in school. Okay. And it's not being about being a good kid or a bad kid. It's just that your peers are who you go to school with. Your peers are who you're with. And you don't tell your parents everything because you don't think that your parents understand everything. And in all honesty, we don't understand what it's like living in this generation. Um, I didn't grow up in a generation where I even had a cell phone. Um, so to live in a generation where you're bringing cell phones to school and you communicate a lot of times more over a screen than in person is a lot different. So our youth's communication is a lot different than our communication. So in, in some points, like we don't understand as an older generation. And then as others, from a kid to a child, we don't want to tell our parents everything. Um, it's embarrassing. As much as we love our parents, uh, I I'm a mom. And as much as I would love for my daughter to tell me everything and we're extremely close, there's some things that she's not going to tell me. And if when she gets older, she meets a boy and she really likes that boy. Um, would I hope she would tell me everything? Yes. But is she realistically going to tell me everything? No. Um, right now, child pornography and images of sex and kids being introduced to sex online, um, those are like young ages. You know, you're talking about between nine and 10 years old. Um, when your kids go online and they're playing these video games or watching YouTube videos, have you ever seen the commercials that are coming up? Or when you watch a movie with your child, the commercials that come up even during mainstream TV, um, those are all things that we subject our children to that they start thinking that is normal. Um, we are a hyper-sexualized nation. Now, when you say when you say human trafficking, what you're explaining sounds very everyday. Across the nation, mm -hmm. we are um, students are essentially forced to do online courses. So mm -hmm. they give you the laptop. You're in the home with several laptops, all spread out, depending on how many kids you mm -hmm. have. So, are you saying that? That is like the steps into human trafficking. Well, I'm saying we're really far off. I, th I mean, there's all different steps to human trafficking. That is one way is um, the Internet. You know, absolutely. Our kids are learning school online. They're doing everything online. Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, Twitter, um, apps, and Rich Love, Bishop Dixon, jump in. Um, Right there, that's a way for predators to access your children. Um, it's very easy. It's not hard. You go on someone's Facebook. You go on someone's Instagram. You see their social media. You know, if mom or dad got a divorce, if mom works a lot, if if dad's not in the home, if the little, little girl is being bullied, if the boy is being bullied, do they dream of being a model? You find out everything about everyone on social media. So, of course, that's a huge way to contact children okay and so in, in you know terms of i love i really like that you bring up i really like that you bring up about um the internet due to the current pandemic because now i feel like we are faced with 
an invisible enemy. It's a, you know, the beast is different now. It's not someone waiting out in a white van with no windows. It's someone that's in your home, in your phone, in your laptops, in your computers. And I think that when things change we also need to change our dynamic and me personally throughout high school I was skipping school you know I had already been molested as a young child and my self-worth was not where it is today and there's so many child children that can you know relate to that and I out of my high school I was trafficked there was men pulling up to my school picking me up and you know having sex with me and I think, and on one hand, you would think it might be a little bit safer now because kids are at home. But I think, you know, I was watching a kid recently and he was um, playing video games and he had his headphones in. And I was like, who's talking to you? What are they saying? And then once we told him to take the headphones out, the person disappears. So we have people on these apps and on these games that are changing, use vo using voice modifiers to change their voice. And kids just don't know what they should be looking out for. So human trafficking is, it's on a whole other level. Like things, it's not just people waiting out in the bushes. They're, they look like you and me, you know, and people assume it's men. A woman groomed me. Oh, yes. It's not always yes. the men and boys as well. Boys are getting um, on one of the, on the no trafficking zone event we had, we had a young man that spoke about being trafficked. So this is way bigger than people imagine for sure. I, I, and that's, I think when you understand a $150 billion industry, and that's also sex and labor trafficking, um, but it, it shows the magnitude of just how big big it is. Uh, Bishop, you look like you want to say something. No, I'm listening, uh, but I, I, I do want to just give this this hypothetical uh, scenario. That's not a parent hardly alive who, if a stranger came up to your front door, rang the doorbell, and you went to the door and the stranger said, my name is something that you don't know. And and you say, well, who are you? And the stranger says, this is who I am. And then the stranger says, why are you here? I want to talk to your child, to your eight-year-old, to your nine-year-old, to your five-year-old, to your 12-year-old, to your 15-year-old. There's not a parent hardly alive who will say, yes, come in. Uh, and, and 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 certainly if the if the person says, well, I I would I don't want to talk to your child in front of you. Uh, I like to speak with your child in their bedroom alone. Uh, you would absolutely go berserk. What do you? Yes. I'm not I'm not going to allow you into my child's bedroom alone. Uh, I mean that that would be immediate alarm the average parent would absolutely assault the person at at, at, <laughs> at, at, at that, you know uh, but you would not welcome that stranger into your home uh and 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 give that, that stranger access to your child's room while you are in a different room completely preoccupied uh right. and but what's happening through social media what's happening through the internet uh is children are actually receiving strangers into their lives, into their private spaces, not for two minutes or five minutes, but for hours and hours at a time. Uh, and when you look at the amount of time that kids spend on the internet and on social media, it is alarming. Most of that time is out of the presence of an adult or out of the presence of their parent. Uh, so parents don't know when it happens. Parents don't know how it happens. Parents don't know how long it happens or who those individuals are. So what uh, Jacqueline and, and, and Rich Love are describing is that kind of scenario. Literally, these perpetrators have bypassed the front door, the doorbell. They have bypassed the entryway. They've gone upstairs and into the room with, uh, with those children and they're spending hours with them with disguised voices, with a scheme that's very well thought out. And it's a $150 billion industry. So you don't have people here who are finding out how to do it. They have mastered Business. how to build trust with children and to manipulate them and to very slowly, very methodically, very strategically groom them to become prospective tra trafficking victims. And every parent listening right now, 
anywhere in America needs to admit my children are targets. My children are targets and my children are not off limits that unless I understand what these ladies are about to teach me and others are trying to teach me, I'm leaving my children vulnerable and I'm giving the perpetrator access to their lives. And that's so well said. Go ahead, Dr. Hill. Bishop Dixon, so um, as an audience member, that's too scary. I mean, I have I have my phone and it's buzzing. It's buzzing right now with people all over the place trying to reach trying to reach me. Are you saying that 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 safe that safe device, which is put into everybody's hands, is a gateway a gateway yep. into my child's room? It's definitely a gateway into all of our lives, right? Yes. I mean, uh, uh, so. So, so the same things that are available and accessible to the adult are now accept, accessible to children and the adolescents. And they are not prepared to recognize who it is and what it is. Most adults are not. So you know children are not. And Jacqueline was just on a news broadcast a, a few weeks ago dealing with the same subject, being interviewed. I wish it had an hour on that show to talk about this because most parents are oblivious to the fact, and me as a parent, think about it. We give our children these devices in order to keep them preoccupied, right? So that the parent can take a break as long as they're being entertained with their devices. Jacqueline, talk about that. So I, I would like to say this, because um, I think what happens is if you don't deal with this every day, it's hard to understand that um, grooming and luring for sexual exploitation and trafficking it's a slow seduction. And what I mean that it's, we all have vulnerabilities. So what I'm insecure about or my vulnerabilities are different than you, Dr. Hill, Bishop and Rich Love. Um, what a predator does is their job is to prey. That is their job. So they are masters of manipulation and psychology. So when they're talking to your kid, it's not just disguising their voice. Um, if it's a little boy and he knows that she likes uh, girls with blonde hair and blue eyes, she's going to send a picture of a little girl with blonde hair and blue eyes. Um, if it's a trafficking ring, that's going to be another girl, um, another 12 year old girl that has blonde hair and, and, and blue eyes. Um, there's That's the, the interesting thing about trafficking is there's so many different ways. So let me just give you a few examples because it's not just over the Internet and I don't want people to think that. So. Um, it is slow. It's let me make you feel great. This is your best friend. This is your biggest fan. No one understands you like him. you do. The best ages for predators is 11 and 12, 13. These are very like awkward ages. You know, 12, you're entering uh, middle school. It's it's um, different. You kind of feel like sometimes people don't understand you. You're more self-conscious if you're being bullied at in school. And so the dynamic changes up. A lot of times your bullier then turns around and befriends you. And they're a groomer and a recruiter for a trafficker. So what, what parents also don't understand is that what's happening in the United States is grooming and luring within schools itself, where there are children who are also victims that go to school or in the foster care system or are uh, poverty reasons. And like what Epstein did, give me $300 for every child you bring to me. And so a lot of times- Jeffrey, Slow down, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, slow down and say who Epstein is. Jeffrey Epstein, please explain yeah. that a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. So Jeffrey Epstein is probably known as the largest human trafficking uh, ring and predator in the world. Um, most people know him. He's a billionaire. He had an wow. island where very wealthy people went to, um, and he had trafficking rings all across the nation and then outside of the um, nation. Um, their, their ring was very intricate because they would bring them in from models from other countries, or they would target, um, for the most part, poor areas and girls, um, whether it was trailer parks or certain areas where they would groom and lure those girls. And so, for example, if I'm a predator and I'm going to target poor areas and I know that those kids need stuff and I've already 
exploited them and trafficked them. So I, I now know that they're broken. Um, it's easy to turn them into recruiters now. And so a recruiter is, you've already trafficked and broken me in, which means rape, selling me. And now I'm going to go and I'm going to bring you other children or women. And what Ep which Jeffrey Epstein did was for every girl that another kid brought, they would get $300. And so that's one way. Uh, a different way is you have kids in the foster care system where they're being bought and sold right out of their residential um, centers. And like Rich Love can speak more on that. Uh, she lived it. She was in foster care. Um, that's that's also a different way. There's familiar trafficking where families um, sadly traffic their own children. Um, it's generational or uh, there's different reasons. Uh, so, Rich, I don't know if you want to talk about uh, foster care. Well, Rich. I guess just I want to touch on my specific situation. Um, are you able to hear me? Yeah. You can hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I was a runaway. Um, I came from a very protective um, family, and I always felt like I wasn't good enough. So it was the standard that I never thought I would meet. Um, I was a runaway. I was in a very poverty stricken area. And me having a very close relationship with my mom, when a woman saw me outside of a gas station, and I, and I wasn't the kind of kid that looked like a grown woman. You know how some girls, like they're very voluptuous and they, they look like they could be in their 20s. No, I looked probably younger than 16 years old. She befriended me. So the opportunity was this girl is homeless. This girl is already on drugs, so I can control her that way. So I'm thinking somewhere to live. Okay, I won't be hungry and my stomach won't be growling. So there's one weakness. People always assume it's someone that's directly out of the foster care system or that has family that doesn't really um, want them. But my parents, it was the complete opposite. It was me escaping um, just something that I felt that I, there was something more. And I found myself trafficked, drugged to keep me in line with the group, the other um, people that were. It's very sad because some people that literally love to see you suffer. And my, my mentality of what a man is. I'm still growing and learning how to trust people again. It's something that you carry for the rest of your life when you go from, you know, can give you a place to say, it can give you money. No, whenever I was going back to school, people didn't realize, why does this girl have nice clothes? You know, where am I getting these different things from? I was living a whole other life that no one knew about. And that's another factor as far as the other thing that Jacqueline was speaking about is, you know, there are so many signs that I don't think people are aware of, and it looks so different in different ways. So my my specific scenario is different. I was abducted. I went to rehab, and I was abducted with another young girl, but she was a foster kid. So I was able to plead with the men. They were arguing and I saw like, okay, this is my opportunity to get out of here. I knew something wasn't right. And when he'll get the other girl, bring her with you, you know, because I told my mom like this, something's wrong. I, I don't want to be here. And I was already on runaway. This girl told me, why would I leave? Nobody wants me. So she chose a life of being trafficked and raped because I saw her at another treatment center months later and she had had bones broken. And when I knew I can't stay here, she would have rather have that situation than to go back into the foster care system. So everyone's story is different, but every story matters. And I, I just, I really hope that speaking about this can lift some of the shame that so many women and men and children are living with right now. You know, Dr. Hill, uh, what Jacqueline said earlier, I think is, is highlighted in Richard's story. 
one, every person has vulnerability. Yes. Right? Uh, and I think that's a key point that Jack and made that could go really un unheeded. Every kid has vulnerabilities. None of us are perfect, and none of us live in a perfect family. None of us live in a perfect context. None of us have the perfect balance of self-esteem and all that. Oh, every one of us, and then at some point, all of us go through moments of what depression and and moments of feeling like we're not valued or valuable. Every human being experiences that. Uh, so we talk about who's a prime suspect or prospect, I should say, for being groomed. Uh, normally, we come up with a a profile that you know say, okay poor kid or the kid that didn't have a mother or the kid whose father was absent or the kid who was living. But the truth of the matter is, it's important that every one of us understands no kid is exempted. No no boy, no girl is exempted. I think we got to come to a point in, in this conversation where we say every kid is a prospect. Every kid is a prospect. Because there, as Jack said, there are so many ways that traffickers approach grooming, right? There are strategies for the kid in a two-parent home who just won the MVP as the, the best cheerleader. That 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 are strategies that schemes for the kid who wasn't picked to become a cheerleader. That that there are strategies for the kid who goes to church every Sunday. And I need to say that I mean in church every Sunday. It, uh, that that strategy for that kid, so that groomers are studying the psychology of individuals to the point that they hone in. It's like I know how to fish for trout, I know how to fish for catfish, I know how to fish for drum, I know how to fish for flounder. There's a different strategy mm -hmm. for all kinds of fish, and 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 groomers are that sophisticated. But that this is that industry, and I think the key word is understanding. This is their industry. Banks know how to profit from poor people, how to profit from middle class, how to profit from whites, how to profit from blacks, from businesses, because making money through banking is their industry. Traffickers know how to profit and benefit from all social classes, races, ethnicities, Protestant, Jew, Catholic. So I think it's very important to, for us to say, just get this out. No kid is exempted. That drugs in the nape in the hood, in the projects, that drugs in the suburbs, you know, from Fourth War, Third War to the Woodlands, to set, all that. So we have to understand it that way. And I think it's important because often I think we have these stereotypical profiles, Jacqueline, that when we come on talking about trafficking, parents say that could not happen to my kid because we the house is two stories. I got a gate around my house and security codes. And my kid, my, we carpool, I know my neighbors. Here's what I would say. That what's the difference, be, difference between when I was a kid and the kids today, I, my parents knew practically every kid and their parents and their addresses and their phone numbers who I would be in the company in. My parents knew that, right? I was not like going to hang out at some stranger's house that my parents did not know. If I went to a party, my parents knew the address of the party, who was hosting the party, what time I got there, and what time I was supposed to leave. I had to figure out very deviously how to be mischievous. I mean, I had to really figure that out. I mean, I had to, how are we going to figure that out? And I knew I couldn't do it all night because that would be a problem. Today, the difference is Kids are going to school with school with students their parents don't know, with teachers their parents don't know, with coaches their parents don't know, and unfortunately, some kids are even in church with youth leaders their parents don't know. All right, so uh, we've got to get this to the web. The parents are educated to become vigilant. I mean, you've got to be the absolute inspector of every aspect of your child's life to try and keep them from being vulnerable prospects. So, uh, so Bishop Dixon, I, I fully appreciate that. And again, uh, speaking as a father, I <clears throat> was very interested. Speaking of it, doesn't, I don't know everything. I feel like this tinge of 
still, but not me and not my family and not in my neighborhood and not with my family. Like it just won't happen. Even though I know through research and everything that the likelihood is there. The feeling is it still happens to those people over there. So thank you for thank you for pointing thank you for pointing that out. We'll get into um, some solutions. I think it's a great I think it's a great segue. So at, for the for the audience that's at home, there's a lot of engagement engagement that I see. There's some great questions that are coming in. So keep on bringing those questions. Um, for uh, Rich Love. So what does a parent do? What does a parent do, or speak, or speaking to the to the young to the young girl, young boy? who may think that this will happen or this is happening what's the next what's the next step for them that is a very loaded question because as Jacqueline said there are many different ways that this can happen I think mm -hmm. for me personally um, I was a very heavy child so I already had that insecurity and I think really building children up to know that life is more than social media, what people pretend to be and put on social media. The fact that, you know, I've spoken to girls at risk youth that being an OnlyFans star is, you know, their goal in life, being like Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion and all these different songs that are on TikTok where women, even adults, you know, our body is what we're supposed to be measured by, you know, the butt implants and, and the, the everything else that women do um, to beautify themselves, but there's so much more than that. So I think giving children an outlet to know, you know, there's other ways that I can, you know, spend my time other than scrolling, mindlessly scrolling social media. I think opening up the communication, the lines of communication with whatever adult you have in your life. Um, when I was attacked at school, um, in first grade, the last day of school, I was six years old and I was molested and jumped in a coat closet in school. When I went to that teacher, she looked at me as if she could care less inside the school. So I left school thinking, did I do something wrong? Like, is that something that I caused? And I've carried that. I didn't tell anyone that until last year. No one wow. knew that that happened to me. And I just can't imagine what these kids nowadays are dealing with through social media and the life that we're living with the pandemic. Who, who can they speak to a lot of times? Because I think for me, it was the pressure. It was the expectations of my father. You know, what about the children that don't have someone that has an expectation for them, that they're just running rampant? Who knows what their life is like? I think that communication is so powerful. I see you about to say something. So, so there's there's something important in there, right? So, you you made an effort. You made an effort to reach out to a trusted adult, and they didn't respond. Yeah. You, you say you that, held that in for years. I held it in for years, and I honestly I couldn't understand. You know, people always ask me, you know, I was a, a crack user. I became a drug dealer. I was in a situation where I woke up with the feds, with the guns drawn on me. Like I've lived like a thug life, okay? And I try to ask myself, what was going on in my life? Like, why did I allow certain things? Why was I doing all of those things? And people always ask me, you're such an inspiration. You're so great. But I like had some self-hatred within myself. And I did not realize it until the year before last, I was going through pictures and I saw a picture of me when I was younger and I was very, really thin. And I told my mom, wow, I sure was so skinny back then. And she was like, yeah, that's about the age when you started eating your feelings. And I said, really? And I didn't realize it till she passed last year. I said, what happened to me around that age? That was when I was junked in school. And because of that secret and that shame, I carried that through the rest of my life until I was freed last year in 2020. So we're talking about almost 30 years of a secret. And this was a teacher that by law should have helped me and done something for me and she did nothing. And that is what I feel that I've carried with me is, okay, so you go to someone that's supposed to help you and they do nothing. So do I matter? Do I matter? Absolutely, you matter. 
Um, and like I said in the very beginning of this, one thing I really appreciate about you is you were able to survive and escape that, and you haven't left. That you 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 try to pull other young women and young girls and young boys out when so many others turn the other way, and you're still you still continue to learn. We're still growing. Uh, Jacqueline, you're going to say something. I'm just. Well, I'm kind of reminiscing because I remember the first day I met Rich Love and she was wearing a, a purple wig that was to here. And she just had this face and these eyes. And um, I spoke about sex trafficking and, you know, I don't know, some other stuff. And she started talking to me and I said, I'm listening to everything you say. I'm going to come back. <laughs> and I did. And um, when I think of, and I've seen just how much growth she's had and just watching her transform and find her own voice and her own purpose, um, it's just such a blessing from God. Mm -hmm. and it is a testament that we've all, I'm sure done things or had things done to us that we're ashamed of or we felt was our fault. Um, it is, for, especially for children, when they go to school or they're with advocates or they're with law enforcement, it is their job to protect those children and make sure that they are not hurt. And the fact that her teacher made her feel like she didn't matter and also not find out how did this happen in a school? Makes her just as complicit. And that's a huge issue and a problem because imagine if this happened to other children um, and they didn't turn out like rich love. Um, you know, and and they 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 didn't survive what happened to them. And and I think in this nation, we have to start holding our not just other people accountable, but ourselves accountable. Um, it's not just that teacher, it's all of us. When you look at how we objectify women, um, women think in order to get the most likes, they have to dress half naked to be on Instagram. Um, why aren't pastors, why aren't other women, why aren't leaders liking um, all the inspirational quotes, all the quotes about we can be anything. It's not just that teacher. It's really all of us. The problem is, is that our whole society has been groomed into a superficial lifestyle where we value our images over each other. And, and I think yeah, that... Yeah, 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 yeah. Slow down right there. Just okay. please slow down right there. Because you're in some, into some territory that I think needs to be talked about slowly. Okay. Uh, because as you, 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 you mentioned that a few minutes ago that we're in a hyper sex a hyper sex society like this society is hypersexual uh and you know if one would do research we'd understand how uh marketing firms uh use subliminal sexual images in marketing in ways mm -hmm. that the human mind uh captures that we might not even recognize at the moment because we are constantly being uh, indoctrinated, right? Uh, with, 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 with images of sexuality. And that our children, our children from two, three, four, five years old are exposed to these images and these subliminal messages in cartoons. Uh, today, uh, you're looking at cartoon images that are exposing their bodies, right? And and so children, for, for children, uh, ex bodily exposure is the cultural norm and the psychological norm. They've adjusted to this by the time they're three or four or five years old, so that when they're 12 years old. And I want you to talk about this because if a parent doesn't understand that your child is marketing him or herself mm -hmm. when they are exposing their bodies, that, that predators and potential predators see this as a, a commercial like you're walking in, a right. walking commercial saying check me out so if i'm posting pictures that are sexually uh explicit 
or even suggestive. Talk about the significance of that so that, because some kid, a, a mother is saying, don't dress like that, but the kid is feeling like, you're trying to hold me back. But explain that so that people will understand what that means, please. You want, Rich, you want to explain it or do you want me to? Either one of you, just as I mean, as a, as a, as a, as a female, I mean, just kind of talk about that because as you talked about it, you were you were moving through it and it was powerful, but I don't think most people were catching it, and I think you, we ought to slow down and just delve into that. Rich Love talked about it in music and in entertainment, and 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 what does it mean when people are worshiping icon iconoclastic images? that are sexually explicit verbally and visually, and they themselves are trying to portray that in their lives. They're not on the stage getting paid $10 million, but they're walking down the street or they're on social media. You know, I want to speak to that really briefly because I, um, as the pattern goes, I got into drugs and I was also a stripper. And whenever I see women now, it's just the normalcy of getting on social media and taking your clothes off or twerking and doing all these different things that yes, it's like female empowerment and, and women empower women. And it's, it's not to shame women when I say this, but I think as a woman, I don't think that they realize what they're doing to themselves internally, emotionally, and mentally to, to say, this is, this is where I'm getting my likes from. And, and I just wanna speak really briefly about something um, that's kind of like a current subject that I, I want to talk about. If you, Jacqueline spoke about just society, I want to show you a prime example of what truly matters to a lot of our corrupt people in power with these tech companies and the people that are running most of the country. One prime example, I don't know if there's anyone that knows a website. It, it was an app called Parlor. It is more of a conservative app where people, it's kind of like the Twitter for conservatives. People were going to parlor. So due to the Capitol riots that just happened January 6th, people were saying that this website full of conservatives caused this whole riot. Let me show you what really matters to this country or to these tech giants. Within 24 hours, Apple reached out once this website got to number one on the Apple store, Google reached out and dropped them from their platform to kick them out of Google Play for Androids. The next 24 hours, Apple said, you guys need to change your moderation or whatever excuse that they use, drop them from their app store. And then Amazon comes by and drops them. So within 48 hours, this app disappeared, gone. Why is Pornhub still up? Why are these other websites that people know that children are being trafficked? How did you do that within 48 hours? How, why is Pornhub still up? I, I need, I'm like really interested to know how they were able to do that so quickly. Can I answer that for you, Rich? I just want to answer why that's up. So with Backpage, um, Backpage was like that on three different continents, people were bought and sold. Um, actually, Bishop Dixon and Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee helped us add an amendment um, with the FOSTA SESTA bill to not only bring down Backpage, but to also add restitution for victims. The reason why was because Backpage was like a Craigslist. It went from making about 20 million a year to once it started selling people, it had profited over 400 million a year. Now, let me explain this to you because Verizon was their server. But Visa knew what was going on, MasterCard knew, knew, knew what was going on, American Express knew what, what, what was going on. Just recently, a couple of weeks ago on Pornhub is when Visa MasterCard said, we're no longer letting people buy pornography where a 13 year old girl is being raped. And but the reason why was because society, it took years for them to complain. But the reason why tech companies, and, and this is what people need to realize, human trafficking and sexual exploitation is the largest money maker. I, I don't care about numbers because half of it is so underground, we can't even imagine the numbers. 
credit card companies are making billions of dollars. Google makes five cents extra every ad that is clicked. So every sexual exploitation, child pornography, Pornhub, Backpage, all of these websites, they are making billions of dollars. With the FOSTA SESTA bill, Google and other tech companies, the biggest blocker was the tech companies because they were profiting. That's where they're making their billions of dollars every single year. Now, you want to know how easy it is to target kids? Google's a search engine. What do you think happens on Facebook? There's apps on Facebook where you want to find a 12-year-old girl that lives in Houston, Texas with blonde hair and blue eyes? There's over 25 million pedophiles on Facebook. There, there, there are groups. Tech companies are the most complicit, but that's what makes money. Now, those tech companies then pay the money like Jeffrey Epstein did to put the politicians in power. And that's why the politicians in power won't change the legislation. And that's why it's okay to marry children, quote unquote, in this country. There's still certain states where child marriages are um, legal, sadly. And that's why Pornhub can still be up where they videotaped raping a child and profited millions of dollars. Because the problem with this country is corporatism is alive and well, and that's what rules this country on both sides. Democrat and Republican. And so that's why big tech companies are driving this engine because they're the ones profiting and participating. So Jacqueline, um, I know we have about, about five more, about five more minutes here. It's an amazing conversation, but th the topic also includes sports and entertainment, right? And so we know that sports, everybody loves sports. We live, we live through athletes. We win when they win, we cry when they cry. And so for some reason, when they step up for social justice, there's, there's, a, there's a divide that happens because it's emotionally charged, right? So can you tell us about uh, NTZ and its, um, recent, um, its recent jump into the sports arena? Can you tell us, or Bishop Dixon or uh, so, I'm going to say this that. quick and then I'm going to let Bishop take this over. And, and I want to say this because there are solutions to, to mm -hmm. trafficking. And Bishop Dixon is one of them and Rich Love is another one. Um, NTZ, the No Trafficking Zone, uh, really happened because of Bishop Dixon and some other people. Um, this gentleman, Carol South, and some other people who made it happen and understood that they could use sporting events to combat trafficking. And we went to them and they made it happen. So Bishop, you, you want to take it over? We can't hear you. I, I don't know how to say this in two minutes. Uh, this is such a, a powerful conversation. Because uh, I wanted Jacqueline to talk about trauma bonding and why uh, why, why, why it's so difficult to get people out of the life of trafficking once they're in it and how sophisticated that process is uh, in and of itself. But, but let me say to your, to your question, uh, Doc, Dr. Hill, that the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, right? And, and so wherever there is, wherever there's money to be made, evil is going to show up. Mm -hmm. And 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 so there are no there are no places that are off limits. Whether it's sports, whether it's church ministry, whether it's education, whether it's business, whether it's vacation, whether it's resorts, whether it's restaurants, I think we need to just understand that wherever there's money to be made, evil always makes its way into that arena. Uh, as it relates to sports and entertainment, uh, huge huge, huge venues uh, where predators and traffickers uh, find opportunities to make money. Uh, it's entertainment. Uh, and and trafficking happens, it's, it's hidden in plain sight. Uh, and, and so literally for, for ball games, for big sporting events, whether it's Olympics or the Super Bowl or the Final Four or, you know, whatever those events are, traffickers are moving girls in, victims in, city to city, state to state, 
for entertainment, to entertain those who are in that town, in that city, looking for a good time. Wherever there's discretionary income, there is trafficking. Mm -hmm. Let me say it again. Wherever there's discretionary income, there is trafficking. And where uh, there are large amounts of discretionary income, there are larger amounts of trafficking. Uh, for, for, for trafficking to take place and to be viable, there's got to be discretionary income. People will spend the money, right? And, and there also has to be a perverted desire for pleasure, a perverted desire for pleasure. The, the, the people who buy sex have a perverted desire for pleasure. And, 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 and so that with money will produce an environment where trafficking takes place. So, so when you've got you know ball games where the average seat is two hundred and fifty dollars, or five hundred dollars, or thousand dollars, those are people with what large amounts of discretionary income, and they want to have a full pleasurable experience that their money can pay for. Traffickers understand that they've got clients on a regular list. They know where their clients are going to be, and they it's 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 that sophisticated. And, and so you got thousands of people coming to those arenas and then the hotels around them and the restaurants around them all become beneficiaries and participants in many instances in what's happening in that trafficking in that trafficking uh, environment. So it's a very sophisticated idea, but we just need to understand. So what we're doing with, 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 with NTZ and, and Jack, I don't know why you put this all on me, but uh, no trafficking zone. We've got no trafficking zone, sports entertainment venues, no trafficking zone faith, which is in a, uh, religious centers. No trafficking zone schools for public schools. Uh, no trafficking zone uh, collegiate. That's for college campuses and universities. And you're working with us on that at Prayer View uh, and connecting other HBCUs and other colleges and universities. Then no trafficking zone NTZ businesses and corporations. And we want every city, city to be an NTZ city. Every state become a new uh, NTZ state. Every school become an NTZ school and legislation household and NTZ household and uh, and we're putting together best practices for all of those different divisions and uh, this is not uh, my expertise uh, by the way I am a servant uh, but my my challenge and my assignment is to lift up those like Jacqueline and Rich Love and others who are really championing this cause and provide resources resources. Because often when you look at a Jack and a little who works 29 hours a day, 15, you know, 12 days a week, uh, uh, then, but these organizations don't have proper funding, they're not properly resourced, they're not properly staffed, and they're doing it all from top to bottom. So we got to pull the general society together behind them. Just think about this, if people really understood it, we would make sure they get funded because every time they get funded, they get they get resource, lives get saved. True. And that's what it's really all about. And uh, so I'm grateful. I, there's much more about NTZ. We're grateful for the Harris County Sports and Convention Corporation out at NRG Stadium and, and Arena. It became the first sports venue to become an NTZ facility. Uh, and we, I thank our, our, our board and our CEO, Ryan Walsh, and all those people. But And I thank the law enforcement. Jacqueline, you might just close out talking about how wonderful law enforcement is partnering with us to help make sure these things happen. And this, this ought to be a three hour conversation, but thank you so very much. I've been glad to be a part. Uh, Jacqueline, you want to close out? Well, I think uh, that came out, she's muted. Kate. Okay. Yeah, Jacqueline, if you want to close out and then. Uh, uh, sure. Yeah, Please. So um, there's one thing that Bishop forgot, and he does so much. Um, we also NTZ legislation, and so why that's important is when we start talking about these credit card companies participating in profiting. Um, really, if you under like, if, when, once people get educated on what's happening with laws and stuff, awareness is so important because it does help prevent things. Um, NTZ legislation has been so huge. And Bishop leading NTZ faith, the faith-based communities and the churches, has helped us because they galvanize their communities. Um, there are solutions like NTZ um, and 
Bishop Dixon and Rich Love and other organizations that are making a difference. I know with NTZ Sports, what we're doing at NRG, um, we have Hetero, which is the Human Trafficking Rescue Alliance of the Southern District. They are training the stadiums to not only be able to identify human trafficking, but then once it happens, they will have a specific model at every game and concert that takes place at that stadium. And not only will um, they be met with law enforcement, but they'll also be met with an, an advocate. So we're really excited. Um, there are solutions. I know that there was a specific questions that people asked, so I, I wanna just answer them. Um, so cryptocurrency, I'm just, uh, I'm not as educated about that as I am about credit card transactions and cash tra transactions, but wherever there's any currency that has a gain, especially in the underground world, um, yes, that exchange is gonna happen and that's gonna happen um, a lot. I just can't tell you what those numbers are because I'm not as educated in that area on cryptocurrency, but um, yeah, absolutely. Whenever there's a gain for anything, there will be uh, interactions. Um, and I think the other one was about schools. And so um, schools, really, we need to have legislation so that we can get into schools for a proper curriculum um, to actually let kids know. A lot of times, really, kids don't even know that they're being exploited or victimized, um, and they do not even identify with that. Um, and then I think the other question was for special needs kids. Uh, and that's another way of trafficking, and we didn't get to talk about that, but um, special needs children are not targeted. They are an easy uh, target, sadly. Um, and I would say for the person who asked that question, they can either email me or an organization, info at rbrw.org, and tell me the state and city that they live in, and I can provide them with resources, or they can Google and look up um, what, who, whose area of expertise in child sex trafficking, what nonprofit that is, you call that nonprofit and you would ask to speak to them and they should be able to guide you to help if you think a child is being trafficked. And um, if they can't find it, just have them email me and I will guide them to the right person. Well, I wanna thank uh, everybody on the panel. What an amazing discussion. I do wish we had three hours uh, to continue this talk. Uh, that's why we have uh, one good way to use websites is to get more information. And so uh, the Real Beauty, Real Women uh, is a great website for you to get more information and make connections um, along with the No Trafficking Zone website. Great opportunity for churches, leaders, sports, and entertainment to create a No Trafficking um, um, Love is at Rich Love Society. I'm sure we have a, uh, a whole lot of followers on Instagram and Facebook and you use it for a great, great cause, uh, even to glorify, to glorify God. And you've done that. Uh, you've done that today. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining. I've had a great time and I've learned a lot from each of you. Um, Miss Yvette. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill. Uh, it has been um, very moving to hear the, your personal missions and commitment to this tragic situation in our country that has gone on for much too long. So I really, really appreciate each and every one of you. Um, rich love, you know, wonderful breath of, breath of fresh air. The future is a good in your hands. Thank you. Thank you for your journey and for- Thank you for having me. You know, for getting past you're welcome. Uh, thank you, Jacqueline, so much for being this uh, system intelligentsia that is an expert. <laughs> that is an expert on this subject and uh, so many resources, so many things that you have to offer and for the, the champion for you and the foundational force, um, Dr. Uh, James Dixon, we just appreciate your voice, your perspective, your influence, to influence music, sports, entertainment, to change the situation. You're a hero in every sense of the word and what we call a real man. <laughs> real men love, real men love in the very purest sense to save our children. We thank you. Um, Dr. Hill, you've been wonderful. Uh, there's so many things that, that we know, um, that we've learned 
that a child as, as young as kindergarten age could, or first grade could be victimized in this way and not helped by the responsible adult. My heart goes out to all of our children if they are in situations without that kind of protection that we should be able to expect. One, we've learned that. We've learned that nine, nine is a critical age and that 11 and 12 are, are just more critical, are, are devastating, are life-threatening uh, ages and our children should not be left alone. These devices are not babysitters. The babysitters are not what you think they are. The, per the visitor at the door, what a great analogy, Dr. Dixon, to say, would you let somebody in your house and they say, I'm coming to see your child and let them go in and close the door. That's what we're doing with these devices. I don't want to recreate the session, but I want to let you know I listened and it, and it hurt my heart to listen. I'm glad that Moby could be a part of the solution because entertainment does sell. And if we can sell these people against, you know, hurting our children, uh, exploiting any individual, then um, then we have used these platforms in the in the most powerful way. I thank you so much for being here. I thank our audience. And I ask you that you share, share and share this conversation. There's a lot happening in this country and we cannot afford to let any of this continue to slip past us, the voting, the insurrection, the craziness that's out here. But our children, let's not break another heart. Let's not break another life. Moby, thanks you for being here. And uh, we hope that you'll continue to keep up with us. Dr. Hill, you know, Prayer Review, we're going to Prayer Review a and m going to continue our longstanding relationship with the institution and connect you with HBCU Go as well. Thank you so much and, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining Moby. Moby will return with Moby Monday, January 18th. Martin Luther King Day with Blacks Give Back, Philanthropy in the Black Community. Join us next Monday. Please share with your friends, Moby Monday. Have a great day. Thanks all.